Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm Harold Holzer and I have the privilege of serving as the director of Roosevelt House. And uh, on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, I'm delighted to welcome you to, I guess this is our first public program of calendar year 2023. Although it still seems like we're at the end of the fall semester, but that's okay. Um, so happy new year to you all. Um, we hope it's a, it will be a happy and healthy one for all of you and that it brings you to Roosevelt House many times in the spring semester. We have a very busy February and March coming up, so this is a prelude and a preview of great things to come. Um, because I, I like to advertise the house, we will, in the next few weeks, welcome Andrew Mayer on the Morgenthau family, Chris, Chris Whipple in conversation with Leslie Stahl on his new book about Joe Biden, John Meacham on Abraham Lincoln in conversation with Guess Who, and um, Maggie Haberman on Donald Trump. <laughs> I didn't quite hear the groan from my program with John Meacham, but that's all right. You're welcome to come to one and all. We're also going to mark uh, 2023 under an umbrella title called New Deal 90, because uh, we're about to celebrate the 90th anniversary of Franklin Roosevelt's departure from this house uh, and trip to Washington to assume the presidency, and we will be talking about all of the things that transpired here. 90 years ago this week, he was deep in discussion upstairs with his brain trust on what programs he would be rolling out in the first 100 days of the New Deal. Um, by the way, while you, one of those programs was a program to employ people, including artists. So while you're here and when you come to the reception upstairs, please have a look at our exhibit, which is called Healing Walls which shows some of the murals that New Deal artists created for New York's hospitals, including two original panels from Gouverneur, Gouverneur Hospital, I guess it was pronounced, down on South Street in Manhattan. They were rescued from that hospital, from the children's hospital, so quite interesting. Um, well, to, to turn to tonight's program, this year, 2023 marks another milestone worth noting, 80 years ago this year, in 1943, dignitaries, including Mayor LaGuardia, assembled at the new WPA-built Hunter College campus building a few blocks from here to welcome Franklin Roosevelt as he formally handed over the deed to this very house to Hunter College. He'd sold the house to Hunter at a very cut rate price following the death of his mother. That was the plan. But the president did not show up. Eleanor stood in for him and addressed the students and faculty, read a letter from Franklin in which he hoped that this house would reflect his mother's values um, and turned over the building. That transfer is another anniversary. We'll mark this uh, this year, but where was FDR? And I'm telling you all this because it has, there's a naval story here. Where was FDR? Well, he was on board the battleship Iowa, starting a long transit, secret transit line journey to North Africa for the Tehran conference with Churchill and Stalin. And as historians only learned a decade later, during maneuvers off Bermuda, one of the escort ships the William D. Porter, right, named for a Civil War guy, accidentally fired a live torpedo straight at the commander-in-chief, <laughs> um, which fortuitously exploded in the wake of a big wave. By the way, FDR, when he heard that there was a live torpedo and they were gonna do whatever ships do to avoid to torpedoes, he said to his valet, take me to the starboard side so I can see the torpedo. <laughs> so he's pretty fearless. Um, so anyway, he, narrow, he not only missed the ceremony for the transition of the house, he almost lost his life. So um, that's my, my own uh, statement on the Navy. I will do no more because of the two people we have tonight, and I don't want to take any more time from our very special guests, except to say how honored we are to have two of the most acclaimed naval historians of our time 
here in person in a rain that's pounding on the skylight. If you hear some noise, it's very aquatic here right now. And we hope that the skylight holds fast. Um, we look forward to what we hope will be a freewheeling discussion of battles, leaders, strategies, tactics, and triumphs in the war. It's a pleasure to welcome for his first visit, Paul Kennedy, the J. Richardson Dilworth Professor of History at Yale University. And Paul, I knew Dick Dilworth. He was a trustee of the Metropolitan Museum when I was starting my, my life there. His bio is in your programs, but very briefly, <coughs> he was educated at Newcastle University and Oxford. He was made commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2000 and elected a fellow of the British Academy in June of this, of uh, 22, was it? I have June of 23, which I don't think is possible because we're not there yet. <laughs> His books include the classic, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, Engineers of Victory, The Problem Solvers Who Turned the Tide in the Second World War, and the recent Victory at Sea, Naval Power, and the Transformation of the Global Order in World War II. And uh, I want to give special thanks for, to our own Stephen Lassonde, uh, who is the director of our student success program here at Hunter College, under whose leadership we have had a lot of student success, including the first two Rhodes Scholarships in the history of Hunter College. So we always thank Stephen for that. Both of whom went through Roosevelt House programmings, I should say, <laughs> public policy and human rights. And it's a pleasure as well to welcome back for the third time Craig Simons, Professor of History Emeritus at the U.S. Naval Academy and former distinguished, I have to get this right, distinguished Ernest J. King, not Ernest J. King distinguished, distinguished Ernest J. King visiting professor of maritime history at the U.S. Naval War College at Newport. His latest books are World War II at Sea, A Global History, and Nimitz at War, Command Leadership from Pearl Harbor to Tokyo Bay. Um, his honors include the Lincoln Prize, the Samuel Elliott Morrison Award, and the Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt Award for his book, Decision at Sea. So, gentlemen, why don't you take your seats as I give our audience the last bit of instructions. We'll have, they will each give a very brief presentation, then they'll have a discussion, and then I'll come back and moderate a Q&A. Please make sure your mobile devices are turned off. And when we go to Q&A, um, we implore you to wait for the microphone. We know you all have much better voices than I, but we're also on Zoom tonight with a big audience on Zoom, and we want them to hear the questions. And after, this program, you're all invited upstairs for a reception and book signing to meet our special guest. It's not too early to buy a signed book for next Christmas or Hanukkah. So don't leave here without one. And now, Professors Kennedy and Simons, over to you. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what an honor it is for myself to be here with Craig Simons, to be with you here at Roosevelt House at Hunter College. Uh, I'm so delighted to see you all coming out here, old friends and familiar faces, and um, many new ones too. Uh, we're going to talk, the two of us, about uh, sea power in the Second World War. Uh, we're going to talk about it uh, in the light of the fact that in this past year, uh, we both had a new book come out on sea power in the Second World War. One, a particular one on the, the great admiral in the Pacific, Chester Nimitz. And um, the other, a different sort of one, which I'll describe in a minute. But it is just so wonderful that Hunter does this and uh, encourages this spread of interest and uh, has its openness to a topic and an area in a genre like this. So my first remark, ladies and gentlemen, would be to congratulate Hunter for actually having the nerve <laughs> and the insight to do something like naval and maritime history. Uh, m many of you may not know this when I say it, but in fact, uh, the study and the teaching of naval affairs, 
maritime history, ships, sea, battles, admirals, uh, has just disappeared from American higher education. Uh, if you ask yourself, well, what courses are there being taught at any of the Ivy League universities or at uh, you know, Stanford, Chicago, Georgetown, et cetera, on naval and maritime history, the answer would be none whatsoever. Uh, it has just disappeared from the curriculum. Um, this seems to me a, a, a great deficit. Our students need it, as well as the older <laughs> alums who think it's important. The students do come in when we teach it and, and come in, in in very large numbers for it. So it, Hunter is to be congratulated for put, putting, putting this on. Uh, the history of navies and sea power and uh, conflict at sea has created a, a vast, vast literature over time. Some of it is to do with books on biographies of, of, great, of great admirals, of great explorers. Some of it has been to do with histories of entire campaigns. Others of uh, particular uh, ship, ship constructions, the economics of, uh, of shipbuilding, the uh, I mean, significance of trade in world affairs have all had their historians. I should point out that uh, as a further comment about why are we neglecting in higher academe uh, to do stuff on military and naval history, but particularly naval history, well over 90% of the world's uh, traded goods, uh, physical goods are traded on the seas. Not in the air, not on land, but on the seas. And um, the United States is, of course, by far the world's largest naval power, a naval power now uh, somewhat challenged and threatened by another naval power across the Pacific. So there is a good call for uh, higher uh, academic studies and higher institutions of education to really look and think about sea power today. I'm delighted I can therefore do it with uh, one of the, the great historians of uh, American naval history in the modern times. And I think that before I talk a little about my book, I should perhaps ask if Craig wishes also to say his introductory remarks about how nice it is to be here with a lovely audience like you. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that a lot. It will surprise no one here, and, and not surprise you either. I suspect that my students that I taught for 30 years were very interested in naval history and the sea. I taught, of course, at the US Naval Academy, and they came, my students came to that institution with already a commitment to spending, if not a lifetime, at least a good portion of a lifetime, thinking about uh, navies and the sea. I, I do agree with Paul in this respect that if you find that rare thing, a new PhD dissertation that involves naval history, it'll usually be something like the social and cultural history of the lower deck or the economic <laughs> impact of ship construction on the GDP, things of that nature. That operational history, what Paul and I often think of as the real heart of naval history is not taught at civilian universities as a rule. And it's not encouraged among graduate students because the advisor will tell the young graduate student, well, you can do a project on naval history, but nobody's going to hire you. Uh, so that's a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think Paul's cri de coeur here about we need to pay more attention and encourage more enthusiasm about naval history is absolutely on target. Uh, Paul and I each did a book on the overall impact of navies on, if not the outcome of the Second World War, at least on the trajectory and probably the length of the Second World War, the way it was fought, how it was fought, the decisions that had to be made strategically, as well as the operational confrontation of the navies of the world. And, and it's a bit of an eye-opener, and, and I hope that his book and mine uh, will do some small part to uh, perhaps uh, make that a little bit better. All right.
Now, I, I do have a question for Paul, which Already. and I did not warn him about this. Um, the first book of yours that I read was The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery, a masterpiece, by the way, everyone should have it as a library. And I, I'm inviting you to consider the rise and fall of American naval mastery and where on that rise and or fall do we now lie, do you think? The Rise and Fall of British Naval Mastery, ladies and gentlemen, was written by myself, was composed by myself when I was a, uh, a, a sprig. Um, <laughs> I think I was 27 years old when I uh, persuaded Alan Lane, Penguin Press in the UK, to take on this general work about how Britain's rise and fall over 400 years sweep of time coincided with its rise and fall as a great uh, economic and leading economic and trading partner of the globe in this similar 400 year period. Uh, so I was willing to stab out and be bold with regard to rise and fall of British naval mastery, whereas I'm um, in, in my salad days, uh, I could do that, but right now I'm less willing to make a stab at it. Uh, power, as I've tried to uh, argue in a number of books of mine, including Rise and Fall of British, uh, of the Great Powers, is relative. It's relative to others. You could have been able to say that uh, the United States looked as if it uh, had, uh, was in, in considerable chance of being almost overtaken by a Navy of Mr. Khrushchev's sometime in the 1960s. Did you not know that Khrushchev's economy was uh, spluttering uh, dreadfully behind his back? Uh, you, there's an open question now, Craig, as to whether the steady growth of, um, of Chinese uh, shipbuilding and the number of ships they're producing may itself not be affected if the uh, Chinese economy and Chinese society gets further disrupted by internal weaknesses, not to mention COVID uh, weaknesses, uh, allowing the United States, therefore, to, s to retain its, uh, it, its eminence at a time when it, it may not otherwise have done so. So uh, relative strengths and weaknesses as between the great powers do count in the measure here. I would say the US has uh, actually gained a, a second or third breathing space as, a, as against the other powers. I'm not sure if you would agree with that or how they teach it at the Naval War College these days. Are they dared to talk about possible challenges to the, uh, the US as a world power, not just as a naval power? Yeah, actually, they talk about almost nothing else but challenges to American naval supremacy. Uh, and this was true when I, I was, just as a little background, I was there as a very junior officer. I was the flag lieutenant to the president of the Naval War College, Stansfield Turner, back in early 1970s, when we were all worried about the Russians. Here they come. They're building these two helicopter carriers, which aren't really carriers, but they're pretty scary looking anyway because every great power is always looking over its shoulder, and we are looking over our shoulder now at the Chinese. But I agree absolutely with Paul. I, I, if you look at the long thrust of American naval history, it's almost like a sine wave. We find ourselves in troughs where we let things go because we're interested in opening the West or doing some other thing, and then there's a challenge and, and the sine wave rapidly accelerates, and then afterward, well, victory is won, we don't need a navy anymore, and down it goes. Um, so this up and down thing is, is part of our DNA. It's just who we are. But the key element, and I think World War II shows us probably better than any other example, is that when the American economy has to respond to a challenge, wow, does it respond? And I agree with you. I'm not sure the Chinese have the depth of uh, both their economy and their commitment to uh, maritime domination uh, to, to pose a genuine challenge to the United States. So I don't disagree with that at all. So here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Which particular type of approach to naval history and study of the sea 
uh, is the one which maybe drew you into this evening's this evening's talk. For some people, I know the the fans of of, of Craig and the fans of this person Nimitz here. It's a chance to listen to somebody talking about one of the most significant, uh, the most significant, perhaps uh, admirals at sea of the U.S. Navy in the Second World War. The the head of the U.S. Navy formerly was was uh, Admiral King, but he was in Washington. There are other uh, U.S. admirals in charge of particular squadrons, in charge of particular task forces, but there's one particular person in the middle, so to speak, between Washington on the one hand and the operations down there in Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands and further afield towards the Philippines. And it was this person here who spent most of his time in Pearl Harbor. It was quite significant if you notice that the subtitle of his book, if I can get it right, is, is from Pearl Harbor to, to Tokyo Bay. And I wondered what you, whether your pal Nimitz ever expressed, ever expressed some desire also to be out as one of those combat admirals like Halsey and Spruance yeah. as opposed to being in control of the Pacific Theater as he was through those four years? Yeah, great question. I mean, every graduate of the Naval Academy, and he was a graduate of the Naval Academy, class of 1906, imagines the moment when he will be in charge of a fleet at a decisive moment. The United States Navy had spent almost all of the 1920s and 30s imagining a, a uh, strategically decisive naval confrontation at sea with the Imperial Japanese Navy. Did he want to command that? If he did, he never expressed it to his superiors, to his subordinates, to his peers, to his wife. So apparently he was either accepting the responsibility that somebody has to occupy this position. I have to be the person who screens the sometimes strident orders from Admiral Ernest J. King, a very difficult person to work for. His daughter once said of him, my father is the most even-tempered man in the Navy. He's always in a rage. And so Nimitz was the guy who took that guidance, if you can call that guidance, and sent it out to his almost equally difficult subordinates, Bull Halsey, Terrible Turner, Howling Mad Smith, to make sure that the vision that King articulated was executed on the seas of the world. And I think he accepted that, whether out of a sense of duty and responsibility or simply saw that he was the guy perhaps most temperamentally suited to fulfilling that particular job. Nimitz, I, I say in, in Victory at Sea that Nimitz must have uh, had extraordinary feelings of, of relief, pride, and joy when, ladies and gentlemen, in the first day of uh, June 1943, the new class of Essex-class fast attack uh, aircraft carriers starts to come into Pearl Harbor to be, they've been launched in increasing numbers from US shipyards on the west coast, on the, on the east coast, and the south uh, Gulf Coast, and now they're being sent across with their new squadrons of uh, newer types of aircraft to join Nimitz's fleet and to then be able to be part of this twin prong counter offensive across the Pacific, which is going to take place from then onwards. But to be the commander of a Pacific fleet where in the 1st of uh, June, one of your new aircraft carriers arrives. In the 1st of July, the second one arrives. <laughs> By the end of July, a light fleet carrier arrives. By the next month of August, another large fleet carrier arrives, and to think that by the end of that year of 1943, the US Navy in the Pacific has no less than 10 aircraft carriers at its disposal. And you might say if, and some people have accused Professor Kennedy of being this sort of economic determinist, you might say that with 10 aircraft carriers and a few more coming along mm. shortly afterwards, uh, it's over. 
It wasn't, of course, over. It had to be fought through in a number of very, very decisive encounters, especially Leyte Gulf in 1944. But I do think that, and I wonder if Nimitz actually said something to his wife or wrote anything about, oh my goodness, at last, the new aircraft carriers and also fast battleships and fast heavy cruisers, which we had been promised for years, were now arriving. Yeah, I think that's true. And this goes back to the other point we were both making earlier in terms of economic determinism, I suppose, that the American ability to produce those ships is such a key element to the war. The Two Ocean Navy Act, sometimes called Vincent Trammell after Carl Vinson, who was head of the House Naval Affairs Committee, that was passed in July of 1940. France falls to Germany in June. A week later, Congress passes a Two Ocean Navy Act authorizing 18 new large deck aircraft carriers, 12 new fast battleships, 112 destroyers. It's a fleet bigger in just that one appropriation than the entire Imperial Japanese Navy. Now, why didn't the Japanese look at that and say, are they serious? Is this possible? We, we cannot take on these people. Well, of course, it takes time to build an aircraft carrier. Those aircraft carriers approved in 1940 begin to arrive, as Paul mentions, on the 1st of June, 1943, and that allows the United States to assume the offensive. Let me make one more point about this accumulation of naval force, uh, and that is that this act passed Congress 316 to zero. You couldn't pass a Mother's Day Act unanimously in the House today. But that House was united, looking at Europe, the fall of France, the danger of Hitler's army, the militarization of Japan, and said, we need to act, made a decision, and by golly, American industry made it happen. And that's absolutely remarkable. And did Nimitz, you ask, uh, know on the 1st of June that that was it? And I think he did. He didn't actually write, well, we've got him now. Um, um, because Nimitz was the kind of pragmatist who always kind of told his bosses, don't push so hard so fast. He kind of tapped the brakes a little bit when Ernie King said, let's get going, conquer another island, fight another battle, let's have it. And then from the front, he was hearing reports from his operational commander saying, I don't have enough airplanes, I don't have enough fuel, our logistics supply line is very tenuous and so on. So for them, he'd have to push on the accelerator a little bit. And we go back to that role that he occupied of being the man who was able to manage, and that's essentially what he was, was a manager of war. Um, but Paul, if I can turn this around a little bit on you, I wonder if you would tell us a little bit about Ian Marshall and the role he played in inspiring you to put this book together. I hadn't been planning to write this book, ladies and gentlemen. I, I can't say how many fellow historians of mine who've started or apologized over dinner table and saying, well, I wasn't planning to write this book or, or that book. But I definitely wasn't not planning to write this book until uh, the marine artist Ian Marshall, who I got to know because I would commissioned a number of lovely paintings of his of warships built in my father's shipyard in the northeast of England on the River Tyne at Swan Hunt and Wigan Richardson shipyard during the Second World War, told me that uh, with some pride that he was, uh, uh, had been commissioned to write, to, uh, to, to paint, to, to produce a series of paintings on aircraft carriers of the world, especially US aircraft carriers, which would be exhibited permanently in the USS Intrepid uh, museum here in New York itself when that ship was brought back from its two years of, of refit. And uh, from time to time, Ian would tell me about the paintings he was getting ready for the exhibit. And then caramba came the news that there was a new head of, uh, I think, the funding board or the control board of a Intrepid Museum and that the... Uh, <laughs> The, the, the wife of the head of the board thought that the room in which Ian Marshall's paintings were to be permanently exhibited uh, would look very nicely if it was turned over to be a children's playroom on the aircraft carrier. So Ian's, um, Ian's 
project crumbled into the dust, at which I suggested that perhaps given all the paintings he's done of other types of warships, uh, not just the aircraft carrier ones, but those of battleships, heavy cruisers, smaller warships, some submarines, etc. Wouldn't it be a good idea of him to rescue his paintings and rescue the project by doing a work called uh, Fighting Warships of the Second World War? And I, uh, Paul Kennedy, would write a slim introduction to this work, Fighting Warships of the Second World War. Uh, as time went on, my slim introduction sort of grew in conjunction with my enthusiasm for what Ian was up to. And then, um, and last very sadly, a few uh, Christmases ago, just before Christmas, Ian had a massive heart attack and died in his kitchen, and uh, the project was left in, well, <laughs> in suspense. And then I decided I would stop working on a couple of other book projects I had in mind and would turn to complete this and making it more of a sort of theme I was interested in. You can see the uh, subtitle of it is about the, the way in which the Second World War's naval story is also about the transformation of American power and position in the world, but with some uh, commitment to Ian's family, to his, to his widow Jean and to the project, I decided to move ahead with this work. Uh, COVID then came in and <laughs> knocked us around for, for two more years, which helped me, I think, to m perhaps better order the uh, paintings and put them into the text itself. So just this, um, this May, I was really happy to see that Yale University Press, which is the publisher best known for being able to do wonderful marine scape paintings embedded in the text of uh, the work itself, had taken it over and produced this work. So to come back to an early remark of mine, there are different ways, ladies and gentlemen, of thinking about naval history and, and uh, maritime history. One is through the lens of the great admiral at sea or the admiral in charge of a, a particular area of operation like Nimitz. The other is to think of uh, the Change the transformation of navies and naval um, e economics over time. Uh, the other is to see it in the in the way of a an entire Second World War at sea. Uh, you're looking at two people who've rather joyfully come together to share their different approaches as uh, authors of books on on sea power in the Second World War. And I think it's probably about time that. We two chatterboxes up here um, should uh, move on, if it's time is right, to... Well, we'll I would love to, if it's uh, possible, if there's somebody in control from above. I see, <laughs> I see this wonderful thing called a, a human thumb here, goes up got, there. <laughs> you've got Ian Marshall here on the screen. I have Ian Marshall you. on the screen, the lovely, uh, modest uh, marine painter there. Uh, I have uh, the next must be uh, a fighting warship, the, the fighting most warship of the uh, Royal Navy in the Second World War, the battleship HMS Warspite. It's been sent up Narvik Fjord in April of 1940. The Germans had just landed their paratroops to try to take over all of the uh, Norwegian ports and harbors, and they'd sent a considerable force of no less than 10 modern uh, German destroyers up the fjord itself. And the uh, Royal Navy, was, which it felt had been uh, caught athwart and aback by this decisive German action, decided it was going to do a decisive action of its own and sends the 15-inch gun First World War battleship up, the, up Narvik fjord to blast away and destroy the German destroyers. It's a wonderful uh, sort of action painting of Ian's at his best in, in the narrow waters of the fjord. There's a couple more coming. What happened to the Ohio going to, to Malta? The uh, American fast oil tanker was part of a, uh, a, of a, a convoy which was fought all the way from 
virtually leaving Gibraltar Harbor uh, through the Mediterranean, attacked repeatedly from the air, from torpedoes, from uh, Italian e-boats. And of the convoy of 14 uh, merchant ships, which the Royal Navy uh, uh, cruises and destroys were escorting there, um, only five of them managed to limp into the Grand Harbor of uh, Malta, which is there in the background there. Four of them got in fairly safely. The Ohio was stilled in the water. Uh, it was feared, uh, they took the regular crew off and put Royal Navy ratings on. It was feared it was lost. The Royal Navy decided to put steel houses under the belly of this oil tanker and to literally tow it. That's the view you see is being towed into Malta Grand Harbor on the morning of um, August the 15th in 1942. It uh, is able to be relieved of the 14,000 tons of fuel oil which it was carrying, and then it just simply broke in half. It, it, it had done its duty. It then just collapsed with metal fatigue. Uh, Mal uh, Ian liked to go to Malta to walk around the battlements of the Knights of of St. John and uh, to make those paintings uh, as he did this very fine one here. Tokyo Bay, Missouri. This is uh, the last one I will show of Ian's, uh, of Ian's paintings. It's, it's uh, his capturing the great assembly of American and not just American warships of the Pacific Fleet which had gone into Tokyo Bay at the end of the war. The atomic bombs have been dropped. The Japanese have agreed to the surrender terms, but they are going to be, uh, there's going to be a period in, in which uh, the surrender terms are, are signed, uh, unsurprisingly, on the poop deck of the, uh, of the Missouri, which is, of course, Truman State. By then, it's uh, Roosevelt, as you well know, early in the year had passed on. Truman had taken over. And uh, Ian captures this painting, I think one of his best, with the large Anglo-American fleet in uh, Tokyo Harbor. In the background, you just see through the mists uh, Mount Fuji. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, the sun setting on the far west of Tokyo Harbor, the sun setting on the story of the rising sun of Japan. Wow. Anyone? Excellent. Good examples and, and important historical moments. Thank you for that. I was asked to prepare a few slides as well. I think I've got a couple here. The first one's going to be uh, his nibs himself. Uh, you saw him on the cover of my book, but here he is in a giant close-up. Good heavens. he's leering over my shoulder. I wanted to show this one in particular because of that tight, closed mouth stare. Uh, it's characteristic of virtually every photograph you will ever see of Chester Nimitz. And a lot of people who first met him with this expression on his face were a bit intimidated and expected a cold, confrontational personality, which is not at all what he was. Uh, the reason he would not allow himself to be photographed in any other facial configuration, or for that matter, uh, even to present himself publicly, was because he had terrible teeth. He, he grew up in the hill country of Texas and never saw a dentist until he went to the Naval Academy at 17. And uh, then, as now, if you've, you've got very bad teeth, the Navy often says, well, we're not going to you know, take care of these while you're at sea. Let's just get rid of them. So, he had only about uh, eight teeth left that were his own, and five of those were all gold. So he just did not like to show his teeth. So he seldom smiled. But when you spoke to him, you knew immediately that his was a personality of empathy and consideration. He was a better listener than a talker. And when he talked, he talked softly rather than loudly, as I learned to do teaching midshipmen. Um, so I show this picture for that reason. Here he's wearing his five-star emblem, by the way. Oops, five-star emblem, which I'm wearing on my lapel as well, by the way, not because I'm a five-star admiral, but it's an homage. Okay, now we can go to the next slide and take a look at... Uh, here's his boss, 
Here's his boss, Ernest J. King. I like the way Harold introduced him, the distinguished Ernest J. King professor. Actually, it's the Ernest J. King distinguished professor, but that's okay. King would have liked it the better, better the way you did it, Harold. Um, and I love this photograph in, in particular because if you were going to put bubble captions above that, he might be saying, the havez of making you talk with that uh, cigarette holder and his body language there. And there's Nimitz benignly standing beside him. Uh, Nimitz was very good at picking his fights, and that meant not just with the Japanese, but with his, his peers and superiors as well. When King made it clear, this is it, this is what I want, Nimitz didn't fight with him. When it was existential, when it was an important confrontation, he would find ways to work around it. So again, it was more, uh, instead of standing up to him uh, chest to chest and shouting back and forth, uh, he turned out to be uh, the man who could make things happen. King called him, not in a complimentary way, a fixer. But in a way, that's kind of who he was. Nimitz fixed things. What else have we got here? What's the next one? All right, here's a talk about difficult personalities to work with. Here's Nimitz and Douglas MacArthur. And if I were going to put a bubble caption above this one, it would be Nimitz saying, look, Doug, Japan is here. <laughs> um, it's not in the Philippines. It's not at Manila. It's over here. Let's go this way. There was, of course, during the entire Pacific War, a, a, a contention between, in a way, the Army and the Navy, but more particularly between MacArthur and everybody else, about the best way to get to Japan. MacArthur had said, I shall return, and he meant it, and he was going to make it happen. And in the end, he kind of won that argument. But also, because of the United States' ability to produce the number of warships that it had, we were able to do both. So anyway, that's this confrontation. And the next one, I had to put this one in. Here's the jovial Franklin Roosevelt. This is on the deck of the USS Baltimore in July of 1944. Roosevelt has come out to Hawaii by sea, did not fly out, went by sea. He liked to do this, get away from Washington. He liked being at sea anyway, even when they weren't firing torpedoes at him on the USS Iowa. So he comes out to talk to his two commanders. MacArthur said, I'm not coming. I won't come. You're only doing this as a campaign poster. He'd just been renominated for a fourth term, and he wanted this photograph to be available for the campaign. MacArthur says, I won't play that game. And then uh, FDR suggested to his chief of staff, Admiral Leahy, don't send him an invitation, send him an order. And uh, he showed up. And when he did show up, he showed up with sirens blazing in an open car, waving his hat and showboating. Uh, but here they are, here's the grim-faced uh, MacArthur and uh, Roosevelt grinning at his preferred subordinate command commander, uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz, on board the USS Baltimore, as they're supposedly deciding which of these two routes to take before the final answer is all of the above. And then finally, uh, this, this is Nimitz with his chief of staff, Raymond Spruance, who, when those new carriers arrived in late 1943 and they organized the Fifth Fleet, for the Central Pacific Drive, Nimitz really didn't want to let Spruance go. Spruance was so useful to him, so valuable as a chief of staff, but he also recognized this was the man that was best qualified to do the job. So Spruance became commander of the Fifth Fleet, which was renamed the Third Fleet whenever Halsey took command, but Fifth Fleet uh, at least initially and toward the end, and, and drove that fleet, this enormous fleet of 17, I think, by 1945 aircraft carriers, more than 1,000 aircraft, 1,200 aircraft, an, an overwhelming, awesome naval power across the Pacific to the Marianas, to Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and literally to the shores of Japan. Now, I think we're, is there one more, or are we done? I think we're done. Yeah, that's me. Okay, terrific. <laughs> We could listen to you all evening. Um, however, it's your turn now to ask questions of our special guests. So raise your hand if you have a question. Uh, we have one right here. Wait for the mic, which is on its way. Can I identify? Identify. They may, or they may choose not to. <laughs> and we'll Hi. also collect, Mac, we'll collect some questions online if there are any. Okay. Hi. I love military history and having the two of you in one place at the same time is just utterly amazing. So thank you very much. 
both of you. Uh, you may have said so, but are the paintings of Ian Marshall on permanent display somewhere? Uh, Thank you. Ian produced a large, large number of paintings, 54 of which were uh, are in this uh, Yale University Press work, but there's many more in this, his home studio being uh, moved to, I'm trying to get right, the, the, this, the studio sales studio of a uh, Connecticut-based uh, marine uh, store called Kashabians, a marine artist and marine and uh, sporting artist uh, shop. If you would, um, what am I putting myself in for here? I was going to say, if you send me an email, I will get you the I will get you the address of Kashabians. He'd be please. There's a large number of Ian's paintings, some of which you know, in, in this book itself have not yet been sold. Uh, framed or unframed, so if your passion is that, that direction, I think I may be able to help you look at some and get, your, get a chance to uh, acquire one yourself. I think we had one right here, Matt. Uh, would it be out of order to ask you gentlemen, since we've got both of you here, uh, about uh, the trajectory of the conflict in Ukraine? Do you know, I think it probably would, although if there's a reception afterwards and you and I want to talk about it, uh, we, we could do that. Don't you think with the audience here looking, coming in to think about this talk on the two, the two books on the navies in the Second World War, we leave it for that and then uh, come and, since I've cracked my right knee, you can easily catch up on me, sir. <laughs> and we can talk about the Ukraine uh, afterwards. Actually, I will say one thing about that, which I think is kind of interesting, that you know the Neptune missile, which is Ukrainian produced uh, cruise missile, sunk the flagship of the Russian Navy in the Black Sea, the Moskva. Uh, and that, that's noteworthy because one of the arguments that still exists in the United States Navy today is the extent to which we want to continue our commitment to very expensive, very large uh, nuclear-powered aircraft carriers as our premier fighting instrument at sea when it's not inconceivable that a swarm attack by a handful of Chinese Hubei missile boats firing missiles that cost one one millionth of what the Gerald R. Ford cost uh, might damage or conceivably even sink it. So I think the Ukrainian war has does offer a few lessons about the possibility of naval warfare in the future. It, it's always in flux. We're always discussing it, but there is also always a tendency to say, well, this worked in the past, so we should keep doing it. And is that what we're doing? I don't, I don't know. I'll express that as a rhetorical question. So, There's one, we have a question right there in the back. You actually started to address what my question was. In terms of the evolution of military platforms projecting power, um, it does appear that the naval power is in decline because of its vulnerability, but it can deliver through its aircraft carriers or submarines, missiles, and other. I was wondering if you could just give a little perspective in terms of the evolution of naval power, what your perspective is, where it stands today, how the other platforms or systems uh, affect it or relate to it? <laughs> That's a pretty big question. <laughs> how much time do we have? Um, I, in a way, I, I responded very generically to that uh, when I'm talking about it. It's a conversation that's ongoing all the time. Uh, you ask me what we talked about at the Naval War College. That, uh, and many other things as well, of course. Um, and, and the intersection of strategic objectives with technological capability has never been more pertinent than now. The technological acceleration is so rapid and adjustments are so quick, it takes a decade to build an aircraft carrier, at the end of which global circumstances and even technology may in fact have changed. So it's something we have to be aware of, we have to be sensitive to, we have to talk about and address all the time, but I'm not going to try to tell you 
what what's going to happen in the next one. It it's going to be complicated. Yeah, hi. It's uh, it's better this way. Uh, it's Mike Jankowicz from the New York Military Affairs Symposium. Um, would you say I'm I'm glad you showed Ian's um, um, drawing of um, of the Royal Naval Victory at the Narbic Fjords. Um, would you say because of that, which obviously had a mitigating, at the very least, a mitigating effect on Operation Sea Lion, but would you say that the fact that the Royal Navy, before the United States had even entered the war, the Royal Navy, along with the Royal Canadian Navy, uh, um, had actually pretty much effectively eliminated the bulk of the German surface fleet, or neutralized the um, bulk of the German surface fleet, and had made a lot of advances in anti-submarine warfare. Would you say that that was a factor in freeing up uh, the United States to put more focus on the Pacific? Just recall the uh, chronology of a great war at sea here, ladies and gentlemen. It's when the United States comes in because of Pearl Harbor, it's at the very end of 1941. So there have been two full years of a war at sea and four months of a war at sea occurring from September 1939 onwards uh, in the, in, off the shores of Western Europe, off, uh, off Norway, off uh, Dunkirk, into the Mediterranean when, when Italy t comes into the war and France falls in May and June 1940. So in that particular uh, 30 months of sea fighting, a greater part of the admittedly smaller uh, German surface fleet uh, has been eliminated. Uh, in some cases, early raiders like uh, the Graf Spee were picked up off Montevideo. A later giant raider, the Bismarck, is sunk in the middle of 1941. Uh, other German warships off, sunk off and during the uh, Norway fighting. Uh, the, the battle at sea changes primarily uh, to one between the very, very formidable fleet of German U-boats under Admiral Karl Dönitz and the British and, as you mentioned kindly, Canadian uh, uh, anti-submarine forces and escort forces across the Atlantic all the way through 40 and 41. It's going to go up and down, and there are times when it looks as if the U-boats have a chance of uh, really being able to intercept and to cut the transatlantic lines of communication. But the greater amount of the German surface fleet has been eliminated almost before the United States comes into war in late 41, early 42, which is why even though it has to rebuild its fleet after the uh, defeat of and sinking of so many of its warships at Pearl Harbor, it can concentrate the greater part of the American surface fleet can be uh, there in the Pacific because the new Royal Navy as well as the somewhat older no Royal Navy can be uh, in control of at least the surface waters of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean uh, as the war unfolds. Thanks for the question. Danny, can you turn this on? Um, was Admiral Yamamoto and were Admiral N Yamamoto and Admiral Nimitz um, similar, somewhat similar, or like very, very different? Very good question. I know somebody who can just answer that. <laughs> <laughs> just wait. Well, they were both admirals, as you point out. They were both very much respected within their professional community. Uh, admiral Yamamoto is one of the more controversial uh, players in this whole war. People tend to remember that he had spent uh, a considerable amount of time in the United States, had spent a semester or two, a year, full year perhaps, at Harvard University. He had visited some of the factory towns of the eastern United States, was aware of the great potential of the United States and warned his peers against going to war against such an economic power. 
But the politics of Japan were such that he also recognized that the decision had already been made. The army felt it was essential to do this, to get the resources of the South Pacific. So Yamamoto, like Nimitz, picked his battles. He said, well, if you're going to do this, and I can't convince you otherwise, the only chance we have is to attack Pearl Harbor, so that will give us six months run of the Pacific during which we can conquer a resource base and erect defenses. After that, I will not be able to uh, contend with our very powerful enemy. So in that respect, I think Yamamoto and Nimitz were alike in that they could see what was possible, what was practical, and to work within the parameters in which they lived. I mean, I think Yamamoto would have said, if I'm in charge, don't do this. But he saw that, no, this was going to happen. Well, then let's do it this way. And, and there is a similarity in that respect between Yamamoto and Nimitz, in that Nimitz perhaps would have said, are we sure we want to invade Guadalcanal in August of 1942? We don't have the sea lift capability to sustain the Marines. We might take the landing site, but can we feed, supply, reinforce, and give them am the ammunition they need to stay there? It was a very problematical question, but clearly King was going to do this, so Nimitz worked within those parameters to support them as best he could. So I think in those ways, they were both thoughtful um, managers of war working within the environment that they had. Paul. Here's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think, don't you, that Yamamoto would have probably been a much more fun guy to have over breakfast <laughs> <laughs> and to be talking about warships and things, whereas Nimitz, for all of his great you know, qualities, is the quiet, taciturn guy. You get a little out of him. I think Yamamoto would have been all over the place at the breakfast table, and that always makes fun, especially if you're a grandfather. <laughs> I have to say, this young man um, is one of the best walking advertisements for the Hunter College Elementary School. Um, <laughs> he's a student there, and when he was in first grade or kindergarten? No, when you, when you came on the tour, what grade were you? Oh, it was third grade. Now, then I accept all of the criticisms you gave me. I, I, <laughs> I gave him a tour of his class, a tour of Roosevelt House, during which all of my errors were pointed out during the tour. So he, <laughs> I, I, you corrected me. Now I give a much better tour. But don't come on it yet. OK, <laughs> who else has a question? Do you have a, a question from the Sure, Zoom? yeah. We could oh. do a question from Zoom. Okay. Here's um, a question from Zoom attendee David Margulies. Alfred Thayer Mahan argued that naval power is indispensable to a country's status as a power in international trade. How has that theory held up 130 years later? Uh, Mahan was a, a, a prime author, prime uh, ideological, uh, historical source of writing about the influence of sea power upon history, also coming out of the Naval War College, and also believing that behind all of this story of warships and admirals, there was something else happening. There was, a, there was an economic dimension to it, and there was an area of, of maritime trade, which was to be increasingly important for the United States, despite its very large continental internal markets. I think that the more we enter in th into and through the 21st century, we're going to see more and more of a dimension of of uh, overseas trade, maritime trade, being of, of significance so that uh, it holds up and therefore the preservation of the sea routes throughout the 21st century is also going to be of great significance for this country and the Western world, no doubt about it. Well, I, I think that is true. Uh, I'm not going to disagree with Paul Kennedy, certainly not in public. <laughs> but I'm also going to say that Mahan was an author of his time. Uh, in addition to pointing out rightly that there's a kind of a semi-simple syllogism between uh, trade brings wealth, wealth brings power, power brings influence, and they're 
therefore, the, the route to becoming a great nation, a great power, is by the sea. That, that's still true. He also made the argument that the way you command the sea is by having the largest battleship fleet. You sweep your enemy's battleship fleet off the sea, and then you control it. Well, the whole concept of control of the sea is far more complicated in the years after. M M Mahan died in 1914. Never saw the impact of the U-boat in World War I. And of course, since then, the technology has, as we just talked about, exploded uh, in terms of the various ways in which sea power and national power generally can be applied. So yes, is he relevant? In terms of his broadest conception, of course. But in terms of the specific application of how you achieve that objective, he's dated. Uh, and he was a champion for sea power uh, in his day as much as he was a prophet for the economic impact of the rise and fall of great nations. There? There. Okay. <laughs> so I, we have time for two, two more. So right here. In addition to the productive capacity of the United States, were there other technological areas that we had advantage relative to the Japanese, such as radar and other <laughs> forms of technology that helped us win the war? Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, elaborate. Oh, yes, absolutely true. Uh, I think the number one and two and three and four reasons for American dominates, dominance at sea, certainly in the Pacific theater and perhaps globally, is our ability to produce unimaginable numbers of ships. I mean, the, the new Henry Kaiser, who built trucks for crying out loud, just decided we'll all build shipyards and then I'll build uh, 20 or so slipways at each shipyard and multiple ships at a time in each of the slipways and just things entirely beyond the imagination, not only of the Japanese, but of anybody else at the time, so, so that's the biggest thing. But yes, there are specific technological things. Here's somebody who wrote something called Engineers of Victory who will explain to you the vast number of, of new technologies, some of which worked, a few of which did not. But you mentioned radar, and I think radar is probably the biggest of them. The British came up with ASDIC, which we call sonar, which allowed us to find submarines underwater. But submarines didn't attack from underwater. The U-boats attacked on the surface at night and remained invisible. What found them? Radar. And soon radar sets were not only on the battleships and the escorts, they're on all the ships, and then in all the planes. And then it becomes, everybody has radar, except the Japanese who only had it on their bigger ships until really very late in the war. So that's a huge advantage. And there were smaller ones as well that this man could tell you all about. Since we are running out of time, let me mention uh, one other thing, which is not a technological advance in a physical sense, but the capacity to be able to read, to, to decipher, and then read mm. an increasing number of the, of the enemy's messages. Uh, the diplomatic messages on the one hand, and the, uh, the, the naval messages on the other hand. This in, in, uh, is going to be important at, at Midway, for example, being able to see w what, the m what is being sent out to from Japanese naval headquarters to in directives there. If you can, if you can <laughs> see the other person's ships and aircraft, ladies and gentlemen, when they come, and before then you have got intelligence decrypted as to where they're coming and when they're coming, and then you have the large, uh, a, 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 an enormous productivity of fresh new ships and aircraft behind you, uh, you are s the cards are stacked on your side, let's just put it that way. I think I'm gonna use uh, Chairman's prerogative here to uh, suggest that we all adjourn for our reception and our book signing with uh, uh, great thanks to our special guest, Paul Kennedy and Craig Simons.